Way back when, I actually convinced her at one point to help write a book. I'll tell you this, for those of you who ever tried to put together books, it's a lot of work. I'm not sure it's worth it, but if you're a masochist like we are, <laughs> we actually put one together. So topic today is on body composition, and I know everyone has an interest in this, uh, particularly since we all measure body composition in you know whatever form or fashion. So uh, Dr. Smith-Ryan, take it away. All right, you guys can see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I was going to say this is probably the most boring topic, so hopefully uh, we can uh, make it exciting, especially as you all are getting hungry and right before lunch. Um, so I like this. I'm not unfortunately going to talk about how we can gain more lean mass, but hopefully maybe how we can measure it more accurately. Uh, and this is just one prong of my research, but um, I think a pretty important one when we're trying to evaluate whether some sort of exercise and nutrition intervention changes body composition. Oops. Sorry, that's keeping you guys on your toes. Can you hear that? Uh, did you hear that song? That's supposed to come next, but did you guys hear that? No, okay. No, is there a song there somewhere? It is, um, oh. <laughs> but I don't know why it's not working. That's okay. It was Meg Stallion, body yaddy yaddy. You guys can now oh, okay. know every time you hear body composition, keep that in your mind. Okay. Okay, so a couple uh, conflicts of interest, just I do a, a lot of work with body composition in some different companies. Um, that doesn't mean that I promote them. Uh, interestingly enough, I consult for Hologic and don't even use a Hologic machine. So I'm um, just putting that out there. So I, I just want to, you know, give some perspective on body composition. To me, bodies are quite fascinating and a lot of my interest actually started uh, as an athlete, I was a college athlete, and we measured body composition like every three weeks or something. Um, and it was quite excessive. And we can see that composition doesn't always relate to performance, but it, it, it is important. And so when we measure it, it can give us a lot of different uh, insights. And then more recently, I know there was a lot of traction with these covers. And I want to say, you know, that the composition doesn't tell us everything about health. Uh, but it does play a big role. So just looking at a person, you can't tell if they're healthy or not. But when we go and measure fat mass, lean mass, distribution of fat mass and lean mass, it is quite predictive. Um, so just kind of an interesting story. I see a lot of retired NFL athletes. And um, usually by the before I get their blood work, I can predict whether they'll have diabetes, prediabetes by just the amount of body composition that they have or the body fat they have and where it's distributed. So it is an important tool, uh, composition and measuring composition that can be quite helpful when we look at the clinical aspects as well as their performance aspects, which I'll show some today. The other piece I wanted to just give some insight into, um, I remember when I was at the o University of Oklahoma and we were measuring all these young, vibrant college students, they looked so fit and we would measure them. Um, and it's really where this idea, I mean, we didn't come up with this, but the idea of skinny fat came uh, about where all these people were quite um, thin, but when we would measure their composition, they would be actually quite obese. And so I tried to submit a grant about this, or I put it together, talked to program officer, and they said, this doesn't exist. Like you, this normal weight, obesity, skinny fat doesn't exist. So then I went out and we've done, it's, we're probably on year five of tracking college students to try and identify um, how many or what's the prevalence of normal weight obesity. So I wanted to share this to demonstrate that BMI, obviously most of us know is not um, very effective, but when we look at this normal young sample, so we had in this particular, this is the paper that's published, but we've continued to collect data. Normal BMI, 14% of the sample were, were uh, essentially obese. Um, if we were to translate that to, let's say, our UNC population, that's about 2,700 normal weight obese individuals. So they're walking around, no concern about health, um, yet they're obese. And when we look at some of the um, st uh, differences, so just demonstrating briefly that the normal weight obese group um, obviously has significantly more body fat, um, oftentimes lower lean mass, which can have significant implications. The other thing I want to share, so this is data from my lab. Um, it's uh, of about 872 adults uh, looking at the relationship of BMI versus percent fat. And just really representing and showing that BMI um, is not related 
to body fat. So body fat can give us much more insight and it tends to fall apart and be less related when we look at different races. Um, and so just broadly, you know, that the goal or my message is measuring percent fat can, can really be a valuable clinical tool. So let's get into some of the measurement. Um, I'm gonna give a brief overview and hopefully give you some applications. So most common methods of composition are two compartment models. And essentially they split the body or measure the body of fat mass and fat-free mass. These are great uh, for many reasons. They're quick, uh, often they can be portable. They're, they're usually more affordable, um, but they do rely on assumptions. And this is what I think is important when we go for measurement or understanding uh, what method you're using for what population. So the assumption for many of these devices that is that fat-free mass is the same for everyone. Fat-free mass density is the same for everyone. When we really know that fat-free mass varies based on sex, age, race, and percent body fat. Um, so as we build upon this, or if we can measure more compartments, something like bone density, and water distribution, then our models tend to be more accurate because we're no longer assuming that these compartments are the same. So then even just more perspective, I think cost, time, all these things matter. So here's some common two compartment models. The bod pod, you can see, you know, 10 minutes, uh, it, fairly easy to use. This assumes that the fat-free mass density for everyone is the same. So when you start looking at different ages and uh, populations and some of the validity of this device goes away. More commonly, some total body water devices. These are popping up in the technology, I, I will say, is, is um, vastly improving. So something like an in-body 17,000, very quick, um, you know, doesn't take a lot of uh, prep time, where some of the cheaper devices, more of the portable, um, still very quick. These are limited based on the assumptions of extremity length. And so what I mean by that is if you're dealing with individuals that are much taller than your average Caucasian male, the validity of these devices will go down. Um, we just finished a pretty large study looking at different total body water methods. Um, we had published using this SFB7 against deuterium, and this tended to be our go-to. Interestingly, uh, the in-body 770 tends to be pretty accurate as well for total body water. Um, the validity of this device in, like, let's say, tall athletes or different races is not as good. Ultrasound is, is kind of interesting. My lab has looked at this a lot just at, due to portability, um, but this also assumes that fat-free mass density is the same. Um, and then with more recent technology, 3D body imaging, this is just one of the devices. Um, there's benefits that it gives us uh, uh, circumferences pretty rapidly and it's pretty quick. Uh, we have looked at the validity, which I'll show here in a second. So two compartment models, just to give you some of this uh, information. So really looking at the validity of the BIA or the stand up in body, this is being used in so many different populations because it's so quick. Um, we wanted to compare, be the first to compare to a multi-compartment model. And collectively the data shows that these uh, multi-frequency BIA uh, units overestimate, overestimate percent fat and fat mass and underestimates fat-free mass. So uh, just to give a perspective here, if we're comparing against the 4C model, fat mass may be overestimated by 2.6 kilograms. You can see about 4% higher for per, uh, body fat and about three less kilograms for fat-free mass. Um, that is not talking about tracking changes, which I'll talk here uh, a little bit later. So it maybe not the most valid, but good to know kind of the, where the variation stands. Um, my lab and others, so I know Tinsley will be on here later, looking at some of these uh, 3D body imaging devices, which are quite fascinating because they're so quick. Um, so we also wanted to look at the validity. A lot of this particular one, um, the algorithm was based on DEXA data. Um, and so we found that it wasn't significantly different from DEXA, um, but was different from the 4C model. So maybe pretty effective if you don't have a DEXA for $9,000 might be good throw in this image here. This is my youngest son. He really wanted to be on the Staiku, but it, he was too little. It wouldn't measure him and he got real upset. Also notice the clothing. Um, you have to wear pretty tight fitting clothing. A three compartment model. So as we build upon this, measuring more compartments makes it more accurate, uh, more valid. So one common three compartment model is to use body volume uh, from the bod pod and then a total body water measure from some device. And I'll tell you, if I had to give one piece of advice, 
um, if you can add a total body water compartment to any method, it dramatically increases the validity of the device. So total body water is the most um, variable component of anybody's body, particularly when we start talking about anybody that's active. So this three compartment model is one um, that I would say would rise to the top. DEXA is also a three compartment model by itself. So it measures fat mass, lean mass, and mineral or bone mineral content. Um, it's quite expensive and not the most valid by itself. Now, if we add um, some other compartments, we, it does increase validity, which I'll share. The other piece of um, the body composition or application that I feel is highly underutilized is the use for fat-free mass index. And this is something that we've looked at and I thought it would be good to share with all of you. And really that is a calculation to identify how much muscle mass an individual can put on. And so if we are looking for weight loss or even you know, performance to get an idea of almost how much muscle a structure of a frame can hold, um, and that takes lean mass plus bone mineral content over height and squared. So this is uh, data coming from the DEXA. We've published data on football players specifically and tried to adjust or kind of identify a better fat-free mass range. So a previous paper proposed 25 kilograms per meter squared as the upper limit of fat-free mass index for ma males. And anything above that would suggest that somebody was taking anabolic steroids. That seemed really low to us. And so we went into um, kind of these division one and division two athletes and found that probably 29 is a bigger upper limit. And now we've gone in and applied this. So if we have an athlete that's had an injury or incoming freshman, um, we will evaluate and say, okay, what is the average fat-free mass index for that position? And maybe what could their goal be? Or are they higher or lower than that? We also wanted to um, look at how this might apply to females. Obviously their upper limit would be different. And so we looked at a pretty large sample. So uh, almost 275 women to identify this fat-free mass index. Same thing, are they too low? Are they too high? Where do they stand? Or what's their, uh, their potential? And you can see the average of these athletes is 16.9, but you can see that we used several different sports. So to me, that 25.5 max is pretty interesting. And that's coming from our highly resistance trained females. So an application too, when we look at injury. So I look at it with this side, maybe too low would uh, potentially result in um, more at risk for injury. So the other thing that I think, uh, a body comp is underutilized for is calculation of energy availability. And this also would be impacted by what device we use. So just to throw this out there, I'm not going to talk all about energy availability, but uh, a couple of key things and is, is realizing that optimal energy availability is about 45 calories per kilogram of fat free mass. Whereas low, less than 30 calories of uh, kilogram fat free mass is often leads to amenorrhea or loss of menstrual cycle and that we need to increase those, uh, that energy availability to return the menstrual cycle. But when we look at measurement, so here's how you might calculate energy availability. That's looking at dietary intake minus how many calories they would expend during exercise and accounting for fat-free mass, which is an important component when I, we identify how many calories someone would need. I wanted to give you an example of if we used a different method. So if we have a female cross country runner here, so we have a BIA, you can see um, the estimate for this person would be that they're just fine, 35.2 based on how much fat free mass they have according to the BIA. You can see skin folds, their fat free mass looks higher. So this would put them at a lower energy availability and might, you know, might wanna increase that. Um, and then here, DEXA, you can see is kind of in the middle of them still slightly higher EA uh, energy availability. So, you know, accuracy is important. And out of all three of these devices for muscle mass, I would say DEXA is probably the most um, valid unless you have someone that's done skin folds for decades and they're really good, then um, you could use that as a baseline. So the, the takeaway though, is that body composition is just not for, you know, how you look, what's your percent fat. There's a lot of application, particularly as we go and think about injury prevention or, you know, trying to maintain normal hormones. When we look at that three compartment model, I wanted to share some data of why I feel like this is maybe one of the most um, beneficial approaches to composition. Um, it, so if you have a measure of body volume, in this case, we looked at BODPOD, 
um, and essentially adding a total body water measure. This particular study, I'll, I'll, I'll just point up here, is if you look at bod pod by itself, uh, the standard air is um, you know 4.8 percent body fat. Um, if you add a total body water measure, it almost halves the the kind of error of that device. And a total body water measure takes maybe what a minute. And so anytime you can add that water, it significantly increases the validity of the device. Here's an example here. So just a 23 year old male, if you take bod pod, body volume, total body water, BIS, if we took um, the 3C model, you can see his percent fat would be 13.4, bod pod by itself would be 10.3, BIS by itself would be 16%. And this is a really common trend. Bod pod tends to under predict, BIS tends to over predict. So um, by combining them, we get a much better accurate uh, assessment of where this individual is at. So if you're worried about validity, adding more um, compartments would be important. If we're more concerned about reliability or tracking changes, um, I have some different recommendations, which I'll show here in a second. And then lastly, like a four compartment model or a five compartment model, this right now is considered the criterion method. And, and there's a reason. A lot of times reviewers will say, well, you have more compartments so that induces more error. When actuality, uh, because no longer are you assuming these assumptions, you're actually measuring them, it reduces the error and provides greater accuracy. So the standard four compartment model is to get bod pod or get body volume. This could be bod pod or underwater weighing. Some measure of total body water, whether that be BIS or deuterium, uh, DEXA for bone mineral content, and then a calibrated scale, scale for body mass. And then you would take that to get percent fat and fat-free mass. The other thing I always think is funny about this is so technically this is lean mass because now we have bone, but because of how the formula is, it's fat-free mass. So this tends to be our criterion method. And the data suggests that even if we were to go to a five compartment or a six compartment model, it doesn't provide that much additional uh, benefit. So the four compartment model tends to be kind of the continual go gold standard. It's also not the most feasible for every lab. So that's part of why I continue to do this work is how can we make it more feasible if you don't have you know, thousands of these devices or the time. So one thing my lab did was to evaluate more of a modified four compartment model, and that is to use DEXA. So we used some equations from DEXA. Um, we kind of thought, well, if, there's, if we have all these compartments, why could we not identify body volume? And there was one other paper that um, had a much smaller sample size of about 12 that had attempted to do this as well. And so we created this modified four compartment model by using DEXA and a total body water um, assessment. And since then, so that was, I think 2015, maybe I did that. And since then we validated it in several populations. So I just show you kind of an application here of a 20 year old female um, using bod pod uh, for body volume, total body water for BIS, DEXA, and then our DEXA body volume equation. Um, and you can see kind of the, the breakdown here. Uh, BIS underpredicts, in this case for this female, bod pod overpredict percent fat, so does DEXA. And then the 4C model is pretty darn close to the, um, the regular 4C. And so that significantly decreases, decreases not only equipment, but also time. So now you're looking at a DEXA scan plus a, a one minute water scan. And we've gone on to look at that, um, this in overweight and obese individuals, if you were to use different models of the DEXA, and then more recently published, um, how about if we look at lean people or male versus female, and it still tends to kind of be one of the most valid techniques. So I've been talking about validity, which is uh, just a reminder is, is the device measuring what it's supposed to be measuring? And you can kind of see as we add the more compartments, we significantly increase the validity. Some people don't care about validity, which I get. It's more about tracking. Um, so how can we have the most reliable device? Um, just for example, this isn't showing it, but I always like to joke with bod pod that it is the most um, reliably invalid device. It will give you the wrong numbers repeatedly, which is something to be said for that. Um, and you can see 
total body water methods are not the most reliable. So, uh, you know, a lot of our high level devices, bod pod, DEXA, multi-compartment is going to, they're going to have good reliability. Um, so oftentimes that's more of a, a question uh, or of a concern. The other key piece I would put in here is that the more reliable, which means the more sensitive to change. Um, a lot of times we measure too, body composition too frequently. Um, and so here, just an example, uh, for this person, um, and if we are using, you know, a 3% fat error, we need it to be, or if we're looking at reliability of some of these devices, we would need um, to see a 3% fat change for it to be real. So here, if you look at a 200 pound male who's 20% body fat, after a 3% fat loss, here's his numbers, meaning that he needs about a difference of six pounds of fat needed for that value to actually be a real change. And I say that because a lot of times we're measuring athletes, even in my lab, and they're distraught that their numbers are so different when actuality, it's just from device error and not actual composition change. And that's the same too, when we start thinking about study design, we need to make sure we, we have the most reliable device and enough time to measure that change. Uh, so with this, we wanted to look in my lab. Um, this is a study that's in review. Um, it's not often feasible. If I go back to reliability and validity, we often have people come in eight to 12 hours fasted, um, not having exercised or caffeine, really these really inflexible guidelines that really don't work um, or that be hard to work around. So we wanted to look at, well, what happens if we feed a high protein versus a high carb versus an ad libitum meal versus a fasting kind of two or right before composition measurements to improve feasibility. Um, and I'll just show you here um, demonstrated that the, the DEXA all, all together, the DEXA um, will not, is not that sensitive to some of these feeding changes. And I split it up to be uh, men and women because they are different um, and sometimes in how they respond. Um, and you can see that, for example, the percent fat of a female um, using the DEXA will be higher after a meal than it would be a male. Um, altogether, when you look statistically, a 900 gram meal that was about the total size of all the meals did not significantly influence a DEXA measurement. Um, so our takeaway from that uh, an application is that you probably don't need an eight hour fast um, prior to some of these techniques. The four compartment model was a bit more sensitive. You can see even for uh, 4C fat, 4C lean um, and fat mass that there, it was a little bit more affected by the food and fluid. So you probably want to follow more strict fasting guidelines for those um, multi-compartment models. We also have another paper in review looking at the differences in um, different races for composition. And I just, we kind of went in thinking that there would be significant differences across races based on the assumptions that I mentioned at the beginning. And really what we saw is that, so you, these are highlighted here, DEXA tends to over predict um, for all races, BOD pod tends to under predict for all races. Um, oddly enough, in this case, in our sample in body was more close, but you can see not as accurate for Caucasian. Um, and so we, our takeaway is that um, it may not uh, matter if we look at kind of globally some of these devices, but ultimately that four compartment model or a multi-compartment model for different races is going to provide the greatest accuracy. And then I wanted to present some data here. So this man, this image here is what apparently is the ideal male physique, um, I guess similar to the dad bod. But if we were to measure using multiple devices, this is, this is kind of what it would look like. Just throw it out, the variability of different devices. So you can see ranging, we're looking at like sometimes a 5% difference. And it's important to recognize that if we're looking at validity, one, you need to stick with the same device and understand the error of that device. So if we look at something like the 4C using um, DEXA or in-body, um, that multi-compartment model is going to give us a better kind of accurate assessment. Here's our optimal female. Again, I didn't make this up. This is what, this is what the internet tells us. But same idea here, just the range of percent fat um, where you, you know that gold standard, that total body water measure, that compartment, the more compartments would be most accurate. And here you're even seeing the 4C, 3C. Um, tend to be the, a, a very good agreement. 
So a couple more applications. So I put that up there. I know we're getting close to lunch and you probably don't care, but here's another application of body composition that I think is also often overlooked is, is the ability to calculate optimal body weight. And I get this so often, like someone comes and say, oh, I want to weigh 120 pounds. But when you actually measure that their composition, there's not a feasible way to measure or to get there unless you lose lots of muscle. Um, and so here's just a football example. So the, the individual's original weight was 344 pounds, body fat was 26.7%. And then be able to calculate percent desired percent fat. This was based on data from our team to look at position specific, what's kind of an optimal percent fat for our style of play. Um, and then we can use that data to calculate uh, optimal weight by looking at, here's our current kind of uh, amount of fat, how much fat free weight and then our new goal body fat. And so ideally, if this individual were to get to 22% body fat, the total would be 323. And so, and you can see at 24% body fat, the weight. So it, what I'm saying is it's much more effective and appropriate to say what the body fat should be for our goal of the individual you're working with, opposed to just weight, because so many things can go into weight. Um, it's that composition that will matter. And we often know that weight doesn't change and composition does. The other key thing, and this was just, you know, an application even for my life specifically, I know as a college athlete, um, anytime I got less than 15% body fat as a college athlete, which is really not that low for a female runner, I would get a stress fracture. And so I could very easily track when I got to, to that level that I needed to obviously do something to slightly increase body fat. It's also important to recognize too, you know, that variation and that periodization um, of composition. We don't need to be lean all the time, every aspect, all time throughout the year. And looking kind of an application of this, um, this was based on my initial injury kind of past and interest in stress fracture. A lot of people think it's a bone density issue. Um, we did a study looking at uh, some of our cross country team to kind of look at characteristics of those individuals that have had a stress fr fracture versus not stress fracture and um, really saw that it was more of a composition difference. It's, this is very common too. It's not a bone density issue either. Um, it's more a lean mass. So we demonstrated, sorry, you can't see that, um, that lean mass was significantly lower in the stress fracture group, as well as the muscle size and quality. Um, and, and so to me, that's a bigger message we took back to the team and said, like, you need to add some strength training to these individuals. It's not a bone issue. It's a muscle um, issue. So lower size muscle quality. Uh, another application that we use a lot to, to share with you is looking at injury. So this individual is the same person I, I showed at the beginning um, uh, of application. So 344 pounds, he had a large emphasis on weight loss. You can see we use DEXA that uh, one of the benefits of DEXA is it gives us segmental differences. So this individual you can see had 14.7 kilograms of muscle in his left leg, almost 17.7 almost in his right leg. So a very large muscle imbalance. Uh, this individual played, had no ex exercise restrictions, um, was able to lose a good amount of weight, maintain muscle mass, you know, back to return to play. But when we looked, um, he still had this very large muscle imbalance. And unfortunately, this individual went to go on to get re-injured and then actually ended up having to um, quit the team because of the injury. And so the muscle mass imbalances can be pretty um, insightful. And then lastly, just uh, one thing that we've been using for body composition with the whole return to play is that, you know, all these athletes have been in quarantine and at home, uh, and how can we identify if they're ready to play or what's their, their risk? And so we took our football team and we had measured them pre-quarantine, like post-season in March. And then we measured them again in June prior to them returning um, to the field. Interestingly, it was quite the COVID outbreak in the lab, um, but PPE works. And we had them, we were able to get them. And then we even got them again postseason, which I'm not showing you here, uh, but was pretty insightful. We demonstrated that they, are, they actually did a really good job of maintaining composition over the quarantine. Um, part of that was because they did virtual workouts and they had nutritional supplements delivered to them. This is in our football team. We also wanted to see, is there a difference between kind of our lower fat-free mass index guys? So like our, our leaner guys versus our heavier guys. 
um, which is still pretty interesting. Our heavier guys, you know, it was it, were able to maintain physique. Lower guys um, or leaner guys still a pretty good job. Maybe slight decrease in some leg fat free mass. So our guys looked really good, um, and what they did in in quarantine worked. And so now, as we look at some injury uh, aspects, we'll, we have we can track that. So in summary, to stay on task and to get you guys some food. Um, I would just suggest, uh, you know, when you look at body composition, you have to obviously consider the purpose and the feasibility of what method you're going to use. Um, but doing some measure of composition is going to be really insightful. Uh, and then asking yourself, well, what is the limitations of the device to help you drive what you choose? And if you can use a total body water, if you can include that in a, in a method, maybe not by itself, um, but if you can include that, it significantly increases the validity. If we're just looking at tracking changes, um, some of the best are the ones that take out all the human error. So something like a bod pod where it has minimal error. Um, uh, body composition gives us key in insights into all things, health, nutritional needs, rehab, program design. I think it's often underutilized. Um, and then if our goal is looking at an intervention, we really wanna look at reliability. We wanna make sure what we're measuring is actually what we're measuring. Um, and then, you know, using all these results to integrate into both training strategies, program design, weight loss recommendations, weight gain recommendations. So with that, thanks to my um, stellar 